Hello, hello. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Katarzyna Udawa, and I'm a project manager at Digital Europe and a moderator for today's wonderful session about female founders in tech. Um, I have a lovely set of panelists with me today. Um, and uh, before I introduce them, let me just say I'm extremely happy that we can have this conversation on the International Women's Day. Um, it's an important topic, it's an important day, so I'm very happy that um, we have so many of you in the room and uh, real powerhouses uh, that agreed to come and join the conversation with us. Uh, so please join me in welcoming on stage um, Alia El Yassir, uh, the UN Women Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia. Please do clap. <laughs> oh, no need. Thank you. Thank you. Florian de Kershoff. I'm really sorry, I hope not to butter it too much. Um, business group leader and senior advisor at Advocacy Digital at Agoria, as well as Digital Europe Vice President. We have today with us as well uh, two of the CEOs who are um, female entrepreneurs and uh, they lead the, um, uh, the businesses that have been nominated to our Future Unicorn Award. Uh, so we have the finalists today with us, and these are Lubomila Jordanova, the CEO and co-founder of Plan A. <laughs> Welcome, Lubomila. As well as Laura Urquizu, uh, the CEO of Redpoint. Welcome. And before we start, I want to also let you know that today we are using Slido. You probably have tried that before uh, during the session um, in the opening. Um, so feel free to add your questions, feel free to shoot them uh, towards our speakers. We will tackle them towards the end of the session. Um, but we will also use the Slido to have a conversation with you and engage you and ask questions to you. Uh, and with that being said, I don't know if you can pull up the slide over here so people can log in. Um, I want to ask you the same question that I will ask to our panelists. So feel free to both answer the question in there, but also listen in to the answers that are coming through. Um, and the first question is around, um, well, women in tech in general, because we have these conversations about how much we need women in tech Obviously, I think it's 2023, diversity is a no-brainer at this point, um, and it's preaching to, uh, to the converted in this room specifically. Um, yet, we see that the rep representation is still low. We do have um, a lot of data proving that, and I'm very happy that the data already exists, that we do measure it. Um, I'm very happy that we also set targets at the policy level. But I also think that very often the narrative goes around how can we have more women in technology, in the sector, in the economy, how women are important in the economy for us. What's in it for women? What's exciting about the tech sector for women? Why is it relevant for them to be part of, uh, of the sector? Um, Alia, let's start with you. Thank you very much, and I'm going to come at this in a slightly different angle. And happy International Women's Day to everyone. And we also happen to be having this event during a very important moment, because a couple of days ago, the largest global meeting on gender equality and women's empowerment, the Commission on the Status of Women, kicked off in New York, where member states are negotiating what we can consider a normative framework uh, called Agreed Conclusions, and the topic is on innovation, technology, and education in support of gender equality. So, very relevant to what we're discussing. And as part of this process, the Secretary General of the United Nations commissioned a report to look at this topic from a global perspective. Um, so, I'll come to, your question, to the answer to your question at the end, but I want to talk about the state of the world. Um, if we look at some of the numbers, we know that women own 12% less, or they're less likely, 12% um, less likely to own a mobile phone. The men are 52% more likely to be online than women. Um, the numbers that you're hearing now, of course, will be more acute, or the disparities will be greater depending on whether these are women living in rural areas, whether they are older women, women with disabilities. So this is just giving you a general picture. We know that women in tech 
experienced 21% of a gender pay gap. Um, and 50% of women working in tech have experienced some form of workplace harassment. And 70% of women said that they have been treat who are working in tech have said that they, ex they have experienced some form of discrimination based on gender, which is compared to only 11% of men. So this is what we're talking about is a work environment that is not conducive for women to come into this world. So why is this happening? And I think the Secretary General report really speaks to, you know, we shouldn't look at the world of tech in isolation of the, the world that we live in. So we still are grappling as a global community with a gender divide. So of course it manifests into a digital gender divide. There are long-standing and persistent stereotypes that are determining what is happening. And the numbers that I gave you give you an indication. Because it's not simply about access, access and infrastructure issues. There's something else, there's de something deeper that is going on. And so it shows us that that we have to grapple with these stereotypes. And one of the things that I found really interesting was that actually when PCs came out, um, the marketing of PCs was directed at men. Uh, and so this is happening at the start of this revolution in tech. So it's not surprising that we're behind. So there's a long way to go. And there's also so many more obstacles that women face uh, to get into this, into this area of work. So we have to think about all of these issues as structural issues. I don't think that we should think about it as a quick fix, um, because it's not a quick fix. If it was a quick fix, we would have done it already. We wouldn't be in a place where we're saying, actually, if we look, it's going to take us 300 years to close all gender gaps in, around the world. That's actually insane. Um, and if we don't look at it in the world of tech, then actually we will be recreating very persistent stereotypes and entrenching them even further, because what should be an enabler can actually be disempowering. So I would say let's frame the conversation around this. And I think when you say why, why would women need to go into tech? Because actually there's, I mean, I think the future of work dictates that there was, is going to be either in tech or require some level of digital skills, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're going to be employed. So if we are serious about changing these disparities, we really need to look at this topic and make sure that tech is enabling and overcoming these um, obstacles that are in the way of women. But I'll come back to some of these issues later. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you for that. So I hear there's a lot of work to be done at a structural level in tech, but also the reason why is really to be part of this process and be part of that change and empower the entire society, not only half of it. Mm -hmm. All right. Florian, what do you say you? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's very interesting and it's important to see that, that there is really room for improvement because in Europe I think it's about a bit more than 10% uh, women tech entrepreneurs where in the United States or in the United Kingdom it's about 20%. So really could go up and have uh, uh, ambitious targets. Uh, now what are the barriers for entrepreneurship for women? And I think that's a very important question. I think it's, it's, uh, it's linked to education it's linked to culture, and for example, maybe the, the cultural education system encourages less uh, women to take risks, for example, or to study, uh, step, uh, to, to, uh, to engage in STEM studies. You also have, um, I think, like women, usually they, fall, they feel more responsible for the family, that the mental family load is carried more by women than by men. Um, and, and for this reason as well, I suppose that, that work, the, the work-life balance is sometimes more important. Uh, access to finance can also be a barrier. So I think we really need measures, you know, to, to um, like um, have, having, for example, a coaching for women to help them uh, taking those risks and being an entrepreneur. You need role models. Um, it's in Azagoria, for example, the Business Federation for Technology in Belgium. We are really trying, you know, to put women in the light and talking about the, the Unicorn Awards, for example, we proposed women this year and last year as a candidate of the Unicorn Award of Digital Europe. Um, you also have network of women today for, for technology, and I think we really have to encourage that. 
And and last point is maybe about infrastructure. Is maybe having more kindergarten of crash, you know, for children in order for women to have more time to be an entrepreneur. And access to finance is definitely something we have to work on as well. That's wonderful. What I hear from this is really we need solutions at a systemic level and policies and changes and in infrastructure to support women to be part of the industry or become the um, the entrepreneur. So it's a collective change as well, and there's a lot to be done across different actors. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. An even more fundamental problem after all of these have been listed here is that I don't think we as a society yet have agreed that we want to change this reality. And um, this is proven by the news, for example, from yesterday, where the European watchdog for the banking sector yet again found out that some rules that have been now set as legislation, there's essentially an expectation for banks to have a certain amount of their board, uh, first of all, being women, but also to have at least a policy for diversity. They found out that 30% of the banks have not done that yet, even though it has been accepted. Um, this is one example of many. I can give as a founder of a company within the green tech field, but also as a woman entrepreneur uh, that has built the company in the beginning by myself in 2016 when climate change was not necessarily a big topic, neither in the EU nor worldwide. Um, I can give a continuous set of examples that unfortunately confirm that we haven't decided as a society we want to see the shift happen. And on the International Women's Day, uh, probably in an unpopular ma manner, I also want to celebrate the men that actually celebrate women and promote them because one of the biggest challenges that we face is really being able to see uh, this growth of women also throughout their careers. It starts with education, it starts with the systemic issues in our society and the way stereotypes are being shaped, but also in the professional environment. It's also about the recognition of women that do quite often even more work, but don't get to be seen while doing it. Thank you for that. Well, probably I should then revise what I said at the beginning. Diversity, it should be a no-brainer, but possibly it's not just yet, or maybe it is in our little bubble, uh, but maybe not globally across society and across um, various industries. So something to also keep in mind, I would say. Um, and Laura? Well, my colleagues here, they've said already a lot, no? Mm -hmm. So I will only complement something. I loved what you said before, that if it was easy, we would have fixed it already. Uh, the problem is that it's, a, it's a systemic. And if we do not change the society from the very beginning, it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. um, a little uh, nuance here. Uh, many years ago, tech it was a separate vertical, right? There were other things. There was education, it was health, and many others, government, and technology. Now technology is everything. Everything is technology. There's no segment that is impacted by technology. And if we don't shift quickly, women are going to be out of the uh, participation uh, and, and being relevant in all sectors, across all sectors. And this is why I think now is urgent. And for me, we need to act uh, from the very beginning, from education, because there is a bias, right? I mean, many women are, or I will say most of the women, are raised to care, are, ra are raised uh, to, um, yeah, to n not, maybe not to build, but to take care of everybody, to help. So this is why uh, many women wants to be, want to be doctors, or they want uh, to be teachers, or um, they want to work you know, for a company that makes impact, but they don't want to build their own company. This is what we need to change. We need to educate the, the girls, of today uh, to let them know that they have to build, that building, to build something is out caring. And uh, just one idea, no? uh, when we say the word tech, we all imagine uh, developers no? in a dark room and behind the screen. <laughs> no, tech is about changing the world. Technology is about changing uh, the health, changing the government, changing the society. This is the idea that we have to tell the girls. And this is how we're going to make um, many girls want to participate in the tech space. I'm so happy that you're saying that because 
indeed, it's a lot about the education and a lot about the narrative that we provide to women. You know, it's on the one side, it's of course the systemic issue and how we deal with the industry and how we should be changing it for the better, not only the industry, but the policy and, and mm -hmm. the society as a whole. Um, but also the narrative and the education, the messages that we give to women and girls. So I'm very happy that, that you brought that up. Um, I'm wondering what our audience said, though. Uh, could we pull up some answers, if we have them? All right, so <laughs> what the audience is, I'll try to read from here. It's not very easy, but we'll manage. <laughs> um, what's in it for the women. So it's being part of the solution, it's independence, it's uh, emotional intelligence, flexibility, income, uh, economic independence, of course, highly relevant sector, creativity boost, um, using gender intuition in the sector, um, contribute to design, so basically making the design relevant also for, for women, for the full society, not only half of it. Um, and driving change in society roles. I'm very happy to see all of that because it means that we are on the same page, but it also means that because we agree on this, we can be the ambassadors for these specific messages and we can push that message further and across. So thank you all for that. Um, and we talked about education, so I want to get back to that topic a bit more and ask you, um, when it comes to skills, in what skills should we help um, empower women with to thrive, to first of all start in the tech industry, thrive in the tech industry, and start building businesses in the tech industry. Um, we can start perhaps with Mumia. I remember in 2015 when I joined the tech industry, at that point for someone else's company, I for six months didn't hear the voice of the CEO of that company directly being uh, offered to me in a way uh, that we would engage in a conversation and on the sixth month he invited me to become an associate for him directly so they cancelled my internship and asked him but you didn't speak to me for six months and he said because you didn't make a contribution that I felt I needed to respond to so pretty harsh and uh, after that it ended up being actually the place where I shaped my career in a very significant manner because the harsh school of this person <laughs> was also quite helpful. But uh, what came out of this after a lot of discussions with him on this situation was that communication skills are the most powerful tool that one can have and they can then be the bubble in which you contribute to a project uh, or any kind of uh, other engagement within the company or the organization that you support um, because you're able to elaborate, you're able to engage uh, others to be part of the journey. There's a beautiful example from this morning for International Women's Day saying that now uh, there's an initiative in some Indian schools where they've changed uniforms, removing the skirts that are usually to be seen there with pants. So now everyone is wearing pants in, I think it's 20 schools, and they've seen women speak up. So um, essentially, if you think of the two arguments that I'm making, on one hand, you have the capacity to express yourself, and on the other, to remove the barrier that maybe okay. doesn't allow you to express yourself because of a stereotype that has been shaped in your mind as a child, maybe even uh, early on within your family within the first years. Absolutely. The, these are wonderful examples, and I think one part probably would be to remove the barrier for yourself, but also receive the supports to remove those barriers. So it's, again, a collective effort in a way. Uh, Florian. Yeah, I last started thinking with a figure about education and STEM studies. I think in Europe, we have, a, have about one third of women in STEM studies, while uh, worldwide, it's about 50-50. So we see there is really room for improvement as well. And I, like, I have two examples I really like. Uh, one is about the communication style. Um, to make uh, studies, STEM studies or, or, or job vacancies attractive for women. And the other one is about the teaching method. So the first one is a, a study of uh, the University of Antwerp in Belgium, um, launched together with Agoria. And they tried to identify which type of vocabulary had to be used to attract more women for the tech job vacancies. And I love the words that we hear on the, on the screen, because it's really 
just really confirming the, the study. And they were using like, like creativity, uh, communication, um, societal relevance, which was also very important. If, if you use those words in the job vacancy, um, it will be 20% more attractive for a woman, where it doesn't make a difference for a man. Societal relevance or not, or those words doesn't make it more attractive for women, well. Uh, so I think that's an important message also for companies looking for tech uh, experts, for example. And this, the second example is um, uh, in an American university, which is called Harvey Mudd College, and they had a computer science um, class and with about 10% women, which was very low. And then there was a new boss, and she said, look, I want this to change. I want more women. And she decided to introduce like, um, three main uh, changes. Uh, first, instead of having only one group um, with technology background, she created a second group without prerequisites for pre technology background. Uh, second, she also said, look, most of the time, the technology study look a bit boring sometimes for women. Let's make it fun. So let's, let's use use case in, in the real life with societal relevance. And the third thing she said is, look, we really have to, um, to facilitate communication, to facilitate collaboration, to encourage helping each other. And thanks to these different um, changes, in a couple of years, it went from 10% to 40% women in, this, uh, in the computer science uh, direction. So I think it really should inspire us. And in Belgium, we are now developing also kind of an executive master for digital uh, with a spe special women focus. Um, and for example, again, no pre prerequisite for, for technology. Um, for example, also the wording that is used is also more creativity, use case and everything. And on top of that, we have um, a mentorship with uh, female role models that can help the students. So we, we hope it's going to work and we have more women in this, in this field. I think that's fantastic. And it's so great to also see um, the learning from good practices and implementing these transferable elements. Um, one thing I would say, maybe because it's, it's something like this devil advocate's voice that I have heard these comments before, um, in that, well, but this is making it special, you know, using this inclusive language is doing, it's like being, putting more special efforts around it. But I would just want to highlight that it's just being more inclusive, creating the content for all of us, not just part of us. So I just want that to come across very strongly here. Um, Alia. Super interesting, <laughs> what we've been hearing. And I think, you know, it made me think about, you know, what is the theme for International Women's Day? Um, for us, and it's saying power on. And to me, it really resonates in terms of where power comes from. Fully agree that there is agency. Each of us has agency, and we can drive change. So we have power. So recognizing your own power, fully agree. But I think that we should avoid the narrative which puts kind of the responsibility on women's shoulders. Somehow it's your problem to fix, um, and so we're sort of fixing women. And that's why it's always important to go back to the structure. So what is the environment, the structure that is enabling and supporting? So that it's the combination of the two. You know, the agency of people, but also the structures that are creating opportunities. Um, opportunities to learn, but opportunities, you know, to, to understand how structures can discriminate and therefore how you need to have special um, conditions put in place to kind of dispel that. And I found such an, an interesting um, fact that came out of this global report, and it's called this gender equality paradox. And they looked at the pervasiveness of gender stereotypes amongst the highest achieving students. And they found that these negative stereotypes against women were occurring in those countries that were actually doing well on gender equality. And it speaks to the fact that actually technology is evolving so fast that it's not aligning with the human rights language that usually regulates, you know, the way that we think about diversity, inclusion, right? It's very much a human rights perspective. So I think this is kind of an opportunity for us to think about, okay, how are we enabling? 
you know? So it's, I'm saying this is happening within the student sphere. So going back to that enabling environment, how do women as uh, students, female students, feel in an environment that is discriminating? You know, their fellow students have even more pervasive negative gender stereotypes than you would expect. So I would just say, again, not a quick fix. There is a way for us to um, look at things from a human rights perspective without it limiting the progress. But, you know, just understanding. I think you're going to hear about um, artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's going to be very interesting to reflect on this because I think when you're seeing the biases in artificial intelligence, it's actually giving us a mirror into the, the way the world is. So those biases are just reflecting back what exists. So we have to change that, you know, not put the onus on AI or, mm. you know, kind of limit AI. It's not, problem is not necessarily AI, but yeah. I'm so happy, you, well, not about AI, but um, <laughs> I'm so happy that you um, said this, that it's a lot about empowerment and personal, personal development and helping women with those skills, but at the same time, it's more on the other side of the environment that we all collectively create. Uh, all of us here around, you know, the companies, industry, uh, civil society, policymakers, all of that we contribute to. So we have an opportunity to do better and share best practices, like Florian mentioned, um, or do the worst thing. But hopefully we can um, go towards uh, the common goal of bringing that equality forward. And Laura, of course, mm -hmm. please um, share, share your input. And I will also bounce the next question to you. So we will combine these. OK, that's very good. So well, to, in order to be disciplinated and answer to this question, <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, well, you said again, no, so many things. But maybe the, the, the only skill that I will miss of all the ones that you said is leadership. I think that uh, women, women have to be a uh, teacher talk from the from the very beginning again uh, to step up, to step up, and we have to teach them that they can they can be leaders, they can be leaders, they can lead the projects. No, you you talked about technology and entrepreneurship, so. Um, yes, the, the the women in entrepreneurship is growing, but unluckily. Unluckily, few of them scale up, no? like uh, the, uh, us no? today, that uh, we, we manage to, to build a very, very small company and then scale up and maybe make it meaningful. Um, um, I'm not going to say it's uh, because they, they, they don't have uh, leadership skills, but uh, if we are better prepared on leadership, women will have uh, more chances to be successful, right? Because, um, like as of today, in every meeting of uh, scale-ups that I attend, or reunion, or gathering, it's very weird to find another woman, no? I will say that uh, this event is a unicorn event because uh, it's very rare to, to find uh, um, two women among three entrepreneurs, no? Uh, it's the opposite. I usually attend meetings where, um, of 28 people, I am the only woman. 27 men and one woman. Probably, as I say, no, in the earlier stages, that percentage is better. But as the journey uh, progress, we are less and less. So for me, leadership skills, resilience, step up, those are very important. And another thing that I will say is that um, I've, been, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, you know why, why kids, no? They want to be soccer players? They want to be soccer players because they see their role models since they are really little. And they want to see be re the girls, they want to, to be researcher or, or be, because they see role models since they are very small. Okay, so we have to put them in front of role models. Role models that uh, they open a reality that now they don't see. In the schools, they don't, they, don't, they don't learn. They can be entrepreneurs or they can, be, they can build something with technology. They learn other things, uh, at least in Europe. In the US, they do much better th than us, uh, and uh, we have to copy them. That is all fantastic to hear, and uh, I'm glad that we're all champions for role models in technology, but widely as well. Um, bouncing back, because you mentioned scale-ups. Yes. Um, I want to talk to all of you ladies about um, female-led businesses in tech specifically and funding. 
So uh, we know that the rates for, um, for funding for female-led businesses are quite low still. Um, female representation in tech is low, but these rates are still lower. Um, so I wonder why do you think that is? And what can be done, what we can collectively do, um, both at the structural level, but uh, also as women, uh, to change that and get a boost into um, the funding of, um, of female-led mm. businesses? And Laura, we can start with you. Yeah, so I think it, it all comes to the same theme, to, to what I just said. Because um, VCs, they want to invest in a very promising businesses, businesses that can be really big, really large, they can make an impact. So uh, men, they are much better than women about thinking big, about not only starting a company, because as we said, no, the statistics are changing, but about presenting uh, that this company is going to make a global impact, a huge impact. And those are the projects where VCs, they want to invest. And this is a skill that women lack. So if uh, a VC is in front of five projects and uh, well, let's say three are women-led and two are men-led. And the two that are led by men are the ones who present the largest opportunity for growth. They're going to invest on that. The VCs, they don't really care about gender. They don't. Like, I've never found a problem uh, uh, by we being a woman, and you haven't too either, no, Lou? I mean, as I heard today, uh, yesterday, well, I don't know. But uh, the thing is that uh, I'm not sure there is a gender bias. I think that it is a lot on us. We have to uh, think bigger. We have to think that we can make it, and we have to present larger projects to VCs. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of uh, women entrepreneurs, but not interesting projects to be funded. So let's put some work I mean, some pressure on us too, no? On presenting larger projects, because as I say, um, uh, VCs, I don't think they're gender biased. Like all my investors are men, right? Uh, another thing too is that in the VC space, um, many of them, they were former entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs, right? So uh, as more women make the successful career, towards being VCs, this is going to change too. We are already seeing some women that they are partners in VCs. Uh, previously, that was not uh, usual, no? Now, uh, there are more and more. As a matter of fact, of uh, mm, my investors, uh, two of them are women. Two of them are women. So um, let's say that the more women are in VCs, the more opportunity we will have to, to be founded. You were mentioned, so I'll let you react. Uh, uh, maybe to stir up a little bit of a fight, I would like to say <laughs> something else. <laughs> I, I don't feel, unfortunately, that men are not unbiased when they make investment decisions. And I see this all the time, not only through the Plan A lens, but also through the Green Tech Alliance. Again, it's all the climate topics that uh, I focus on, so maybe there's even an additional bias there. But um, a few years back, I set up a community called the Green Tech Alliance, where we have now more than 3,500 businesses, uh, close to 1,000 are founded by women, and all of these companies are building technological solutions to address climate change. The systemic issues that we see with any of these companies getting funding just get to be perpetuated in the female-founded uh, group. And with this in mind, uh, I think there's three particular biases to be concerned of. So first of all, there's still the concept of the boys club. Uh, so you would have the men okay. that have studied in the particular schools to invest in the men that study in the particular schools. There's alumni clubs, there's angel clubs, and there's just a lot more channels through which you can access the funding. The second issue is uh, quite a lot to do with, uh, I would say, the group thing that happens whenever you define what is to be hyped up. Um, I'm lucky to be in an industry that is uh, really well understood now by investors because of the last few years. Um, and all of these uh, moments of excitement that investors normally um, create for each other, because one 
defines why this is an important investment thesis, another one jumps on that, and then so and so and so. Um, it quite rarely leads uh, to, a, 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 I would say, factually based case, and especially in the beginning of an investment cycle, you are looking at pre-seed companies that only have an idea. They're not there yet with the data to explain why this company is going to make it big. So even the, bi the big storytelling, as Laura, you were saying, is definitely a key component of that, but there's no data at that point quite often. There's the promise of a technology delivering a big value, and maybe if you combine this with what Laura was saying, then that creates another uh, layer of challenges for women. And the final bit, um, and that is something that was really concerning in a conversation I had a few months back, uh, was that there's this stereotype by investors that unfortunately I've heard way too many times and that's why I allow myself to generalize because it's not nice to say that all thing in this way. I definitely can say not all, but a lot, uh, where there's an association of women with femtech or sustainable fashion or solutions that are not necessarily geeky enough. Um, today, um, actually, we shared a list of a few hundred women that are all building technologies for sustainable agriculture, carbon removal, uh, SaaS platforms, and sustainable finance, all of these uh, online for Women's Day. Um, and these are just a, a little drop in the ocean of examples of phenomenal women building really geeky, complex products uh, using complex technologies. It's just that still we have this uh, stereotype that is maybe still way too deeply embedded in the way we've defined ourselves as people and as professionals. I invite each one of you to go on any of the search engines today, just write CEO, write doctor, write nurse, and then you see what stereotypes actually mean. Uh, it's a really unfortunate and uncomfortable experiment to do, but it is there to show what really the investment process for a woman is on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. And Ali, I saw you were nodding a lot. Absolutely. <laughs> so please, please go ahead. You'll be happy to know the research supports your argument. That the <laughs> research is showing that the, there is still this inherent, the narrative that men are inherently more talented than women on, in tech. And also, speaking to the point I raised last, in terms of opportunity and structural issues, it is, it is exactly these things, the boys club, the networking opportunities, business decisions are actually made in, mostly in the informal space, and in a space that women do not have access to many times. So we really need to look at the lay of the land. And really, I will say again, stop putting the, the burden on women. Somehow, it's they, there's something they're doing wrong that needs to be fixed. Um, I think, yes, in some cases, yes, of course, but I mean, you have to look at the structural issues. And I think another point is that to think about what, what can be done. I think there's a whole narrative out there, and having all of us lived through COVID-19, it has put into question also our economic models more broadly. And now there's more of a thinking, and there's a, like a, a push towards the concept of well-being. So really thinking about well-being, looking at individual human well-being, social well-being, economic well-being. So, I mean, I think we, we all... So it's not GDP that measures, but well-being, and that's one aspect of our well-being. But then planetary well-being, also having to be... All of them have to be put into our model. It cannot just be economic growth. And I think that's where public-private partnerships have a huge role to play in shifting the current paradigm that is perpetuating and in some cases accentuating the, the biases. And from our perspective, as UN Women, we are um, working on women's entrepreneurship. I mean, in, in the tech um, industry, yes, but we look more broadly. We, we work on something that we call gender responsive investment and procurement. So understanding the structural barriers, working with women to increase their skill sets and their also risk appetite and understanding of putting yourself okay. out there and you know how to deal with rejection and how to keep going at it from one side, but also working with um, private sector and public sector to look at you know procurement activities. This is an eye opener many times. Are you procuring? from women because you know if, if you're going to argue the women-owned businesses that provide you with the products and services that you need don't exist we will contest that 
They are out there, you're just not buying from them. And you're also not investing in them. And there's a possibility to improve the quality of your work by actually investing. So this for us is, is a good model, and it's not something that we're doing by ourselves. We convene. It's like in the spirit of partnership. There's not, no single actor or stakeholder that has a quick fix. So we have to bring all the parts together and you know, bring the resources. And we're living a moment where resources are you know, restricted. Um, so how do we make best use of the resources that we have? And so I think this is what I would say. Um, there's a lot of women out there that are doing superb work, but how are we bringing them into the mainstream and making sure that we're providing whatever support and opportunity for them to thrive? Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Bishop Florian. Yeah, um, a lot has been said already, I think. But anyway, I think it's important also to have figures again. Today, it's between 1% and 2% of venture capital that goes to women. Thanks. So it's very low, yeah. <laughs> definitely. And you have about like, a bit more than 10% women tech entrepreneurs. Um, and at the same time, what we see is that usually women tech companies, um, uh, sorry, women-led companies have better results, better performance than men-led uh, companies. So why, the question is, why uh, is it more difficult to get venture capital? Um, and there are different studies, and one I know not everybody will agree with that, <laughs> because we talked a little bit before. <laughs> um, one of those studies says, for example, that um, venture capital, um, I mean, a, a woman is almost as likely as a man to get venture capital when she goes for it. Um, so. I mean, it's interesting to analyze that, because if you want to change it, we really have to, to, to know the origin, the causes. Um, and in this study, he says, like, look, um, most of the time, uh, women invest in sectors that are sometimes less attractive uh, for venture capitalists. So again, I think here we have to work on having more you know, ambitious women or, or women in the STEM sector. And we, we need also coaching for those women to help them, you know, because sometimes the propension of women to go for venture capital is a bit lower, maybe because they, they don't know there, they are not in the all boys networks. Um, so it's also important, you know, to give them this, this coaching to, to, for them to be involved or in, in integrated in those networks. And I think also for, but I think it has been said before as well, like for business angels and venture capitalists, it's also very important to have more women because sometimes they are more sensitive to this dimension. And why not, since I said that usually um, women let tech companies, um, have better return on investment. It could also maybe be a criteria in a due diligence of an venture capitalist to say, look, she's a woman. So maybe we should take this into consideration. Yeah, I think we've touched upon a lot of really interesting ideas here. On the one side, we have personal development and going into more leadership. On the other, increase the opportunities and access and having a structural solution, um, but also having more women as VC, so the inclusion is also at the level mm. of recognition, uh, recognizing the um, uh, the offers that are presented to the VCs and saying, okay, this is something valuable. Um, so different ways to the same goal. Ideally, we would combine them and learn from that and and implement this. Um, we are running very much out of time, um, but I want to take the opportunity to ask a question from the audience. I wonder if there's anyone here around. I can see one hand up. Um, I will take the first one here. <laughs> um, here up front, we had one hand. Depending on how quickly we can move through them, so I will ask you to also be brief. Uh, we will take two questions from the room, one from the online audience, and we will conclude. Yes, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. And um, so happy, uh, I'm happy to be here, and thank you for the, for the dis discussion. And... Uh, so um, I want to start with the idea that actually for the Central Asia, thank you, Alia, for being here, uh, one of the uh, driving engines of this year was the link between digital transformation and ESG, uh, environmental social governance, because there, there is no system that can be actually transparent, uh, inclusive, and environmentally friendly without digital transformation, without tech industry. So. Uh, to, 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 to this thing about um, education, 
and the fact that for women it is important to be um, to be uh, to to show their care and social impact. Uh, so these words for women it is important, and maybe this link between ESG and digital transformation can be our weapon here to show women that there is a room for them because their unique perspective can be actually. Um, a very important important um, step forward in the whole digital industry and tech industry. So uh, maybe in our uh, educational mm -hmm. systems, we need to show this link so that they can, mm -hmm. this will be interesting for them mm -hmm. to participate in it. Mm -hmm. Can I say something that I think is needed to say here about artificial intelligence that somehow we haven't said? <laughs> yeah. So, so before we were saying, and, and you are, you're, you're just saying this, that tech is not anymore a separate uh, vertical that is across all sectors, right? Well, is more to that. Now, artificial intelligence is the next big thing that is across all segments. Um, until this year, it was something that we were talking more in the, in the tech spaces, but now all of us can uh, uh, play and work with artificial intelligence, right? With this uh, chat GPT and so. You know who is developing the artificial intelligence? I will say that 99.9% .9 of that technology is developed by men. They are not women. Um, developing artificial intelligence because it hasn't been appealing to women. So the tech teams are men. So can you imagine a technology that is going to impact the whole society and all the sectors and it's been developed only by 50% of the humankind and uh, is biased, completely biased because uh, we all know no? that uh, women, we think uh, differently and we have our, our own ways. Those ways are not there. So I would like to finish with this. It's urgent. To, it's more than ever urgent to bring girls and women to that space. Otherwise, we're going to end up working not in the future, this year already and next year, with a technology only exclusively developed by men. Ladies, would you want to add something? We, I can see that we have to finish very soon. But Just one go. sentence to what you were saying. Um, climate change is a women's issue. Uh, actually, there's a lot of studies that show that women, for example, in the global south need to travel a lot more to be able to access water. Responsibilities that historically have been within the hands of women are now becoming more difficult to do uh, because of drought, because of climate change related issues. So uh, totally yes to your point, do they need to be connected? Uh, I would actually continue on the point that you were making earlier. We need to combine all these KPIs and redefine a new equivalent of GDP. GDP does not stand for anything anymore because it doesn't account for the inequality, the inefficiency, and also the lack of care for our planet and our society. Mm. Oh, yeah, I please. just wanted to give, uh, affirm what you're saying. So when you look at um, the energy sector, for example, 10% um, more women will are represented in renewable energy than when you look at the overall energy sector. So it does speak to that topic, that they are engaged in particular areas that have a social um, or uh, environmental angle. Yeah. Um, ladies, um, because we focus a lot on female entrepreneurship, we're an all-female panel. Uh, we also have, I can see you have a lot of diversity in the room, which uh, excites me a lot. Um, yes, it's very good. <laughs> yeah. um, so here I want to appeal to you and ask you what exact, and that's a question, mix of questions from uh, the audience, um, what would be one ask if you were to ask men for support? So of course, women for women, solidarity, sisterhood, but we want this to be a joint, um, a joint goal. We want all people, all, the entire society, to advance gender equality. So what would be one ask from you uh, to get that support and that allyship from men for this cause? Um, for me, it's more generally speaking, I think 
it's just not having women for having women. It's also for, because of the society today. I mean, I see in Belgium, and it's the case in, in Europe in general, there is a la lack of uh, digital, expert, expert, digital experts or, or tech experts. So, I mean, I think it's every, interesting for everybody, every company, every uh, trade association to do something about that. And it's a message to men and women, um, like for yeah, every company, every government, you know, to have a policy to try to develop like attractiveness uh, for women, to help women um, have, have, having like um, responsibilities in the management. And I think like well, Agroya, we are trying to do that. For example, the colleague of mine, she's responsible for you know women in tech, and and she's publishing a book today, by the way, about women in tech, and and this this education program I was talking about, we are trying also to develop it together with the university. So I think it's really a call for everybody uh, here in the room, but um, in Europe, you know, to to put the focus on that. I would say sit down and have the conversation. A lot of the biases that we have been discussing also today, they're not intended. And many men, sometimes even women that don't support women, don't recognize that they haven't spent the time to identify in themselves behaviors that maybe provoke someone to feel marginalized or discriminated in one way or another. It is really healthy to have the conversation with young colleagues, with uh, all the colleagues, and then see also where the stereotype maybe aligns to the geography, to the particular country. Um, and define a plan, like it all starts with a small step. Maybe the plan is just to have this discussion on a monthly basis. Maybe it is for more structural change where uh, some bigger systemic issues needed to be addressed for a bit longer. Alia. Um, I will go on the theme <laughs> of power. Share. Share your power. Understand that you have, you're standing in a place of power because of all of the issues that we've talked about. So, and don't be scared about that. You know, it's, it is in the efforts for a better world for all. So, and sharing is caring. <laughs> and Laura? Well, I, I think we need a, a partners in crime. I don't want to feel supported. I need a partner, right? So I think all the women, we need a partner and we need uh, to feel equal. And I'm so happy to, be, to see so many men here today. I'm sure that, uh, uh, well, you feel a lot of respect for the women. And uh, so we don't need supporters and we are not the victims. Uh, we, we are, we, the women, we have the responsibility to step up and uh, we need men that partner with us and come that way with us. Ladies, what a fantastic conversation today. I think it's a topic that we could talk about for days on end, and it could be a whole conference just about this. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your perspectives. I think that was very valuable uh, for myself, for sure, but also for our audience here and uh, back home online. Thank you so much for your participation, and please give a hand for all of our fabulous ah, Thank you. Thank you for a very good moderation. Thank you.